so he really had to do it. You have to give him a little bit of credit though. He is consistent. Stubbornness is kind of what he does. Hi everyone, so it's Carlos back on the channel. So I took a little bit of time to think about this one. I didn't want to just go and rush out a video and to be honest it wasn't like it was breaking news. The, uh, the announcement of the XFL returning came back, you know, Vince McMahon created his little alpha entertainment, like he was being alluded to uh, for a while before the announcement actually happened, before he went and did his little press conference. Um, a little more subdued than the first one I must say, but it, kind of appropriate given that really what he was announcing was that he was going to create a league that we would eventually see in 2020. So it's not like it's gonna to happen today, tomorrow, or even in a year. Um, right off the top, I will say that 2020, an appropriate number given um, kind of his uh, friends uh, association, and you know, possibly a presidential run around that time. The thing is, I don't think he would be connecting it politically because it would be smart of him not to, but the truth is it's not completely divorced from any political elements of it. I won't dwell on that or focus on it too much, but it is Vince McMahon and you can't completely ignore it. But regardless, the question really is, and what it comes down to and kind of what I've taken my time thinking about. Uh, while watching the press conference, I even took a, a bunch of notes and I promise I won't read all this stuff to you. I just wanted to make sure I had it fresh and close by so that I could keep it all straight in my head. The question really it comes down to is, will it work this time? And really related to that and kind of the key element of it is, did you really learn the lessons from the first time around? So kind of to answer that question, where the angle I'm really going to take on this is I'm going to talk about a little bit what I think was the problems that what really went wrong with the XFL the first time. And then really I'm going to try to predict how well I think he actually learned from his lessons and how well he's going to apply them to the current version. And then lastly, I'll talk about what I would do if I got the phone call and this event says, Carlos, I'm doing the league. I'm making it happen for $100 million in 2020. Make it work. What would I do to try to make this iteration of the XFL work? So let's talk a little bit about that. All right, so before we go into whether I think it's going to work or not, and what I would do if it was uh, entrusted in my hands to try to make this thing work, let's start off with quickly what went wrong the first time, or at least what in my opinion went wrong the first time. So the short version, if you want to kind of skip over this part of the video, and I'll put a time code in the description if you just want to skip ahead to the other parts of the video, but here's the short version for me. What it really comes down to is too much, too soon, and not really defining what it was you were trying to do. The concept was simple enough. You're trying to create an alternative to the NFL. You want another football league. But the thing is, you had other alternatives. You had the Arena Football League, you had the CFL in Canada, and you got to remember the landscape in 2001 was a lot different than what it is in 2018, you know, potentially 2019, potentially 2020, when you would theoretically be launching the new league. The first one was kind of a crash course. You announced it, you made, you know, a big marketing blitz, you did all kinds of things to it, you know, about how different you're going to be, uh, you know, how it's not like traditional football. But then you also... It, it, the mixed messages started almost right off the top. So you're not going to be the same kind of football league. You're going to have different kind of rules, which they did. You're going to do different kind of camera angles, some of which you know are even adopted in the NFL broadcast today. There were elements that were very clever, well-marketed and well thought out. Having NBC as a partner was a big deal because having a television network backing you, especially in 2001, was huge. That's where some of the good parts came in, but then where you struggled a little bit is in your messaging. So right off the top, if, I, if you remember a lot of the commercials, and if I can find any clips of it, I'll try to throw it on here, but you had uh, Dick Butkus, you know, football legend, you know, as part of kind of your pitch right off the top. So you're trying to appeal sort of, so this is where I think the disconnect was in the original league. You're trying to appeal to this core football audience using, evoking a Dick Butkus to try to sell it. But then at the same time, right off the top, in the first broadcast, you've got Vince McMahon out there. who's completely associated. Vince, now that I, I'm not going to speak from personal experience, I don't know the man, but Vince is not a sports fan really. Vince really strikes me as a guy who has spent his life being obsessed with professional wrestling or sports entertainment, if you will. He's built this whole empire within this genre. But more than anything, in my mind, and this is trying to get really into almost psychology here, for me, 
Vince wanted to do this one again, predominantly because of the failure of the first one. He didn't, it didn't sit right with him. He thought he could do better and he wants to do better. And that's really what this all seems to be about. But stemming back to the original is NBC was not a bad partner to have, but you had kind of this push and pull thing. You're trying to make it appealing. You want to get as many eyeballs on it as possible. And what you were doing is you were pulling from different areas. You try, you have the Dick Buckets there to try to appeal to that audience. You have elements where you're trying to appeal to a traditional football audience, but then you have The Rock come out occasionally. After six long years, The Rock says, finally, professional football has come back to Los Angeles. You have almost WWE type skits backstage, you know, things, you know, with weird payoffs. You had this thing. Like, I don't know if any of you remember from the original thing was they, they made this whole big deal how they were going to be all access all the time and we're going to follow into the cheerleaders locker room, which of course they were never going to do on network television, but the, you know, they basically teased to it up until the point they had a lame payoff. It was like a bad WWE skit from the Attitude Era, which you weren't really, you were still kind of within. Um, so it took a lot of Vince's attention away from his main product and his core area. Really, in that case, this would have been the time the first time around with the par corporate partner and the television partner and everything in place. That would have been the time to let the football people really take over. But because you're trying to appeal to a WWE or WWF audience, I forget if they were still WWF at the time, but you were trying to appeal to that wrestling audience who didn't necessarily watch football. Well, you failed at that because realistically, if you wanted to see The Rock and that's what you were really interested in, well, then you'd tune in to watch the wrestling. The Rock isn't actually playing football. Stone Cold Steve Austin is not playing football. None of that's actually happening. And then you've got Jim Ross in the commentary booth for one of the, for one of the teams. And you had Jesse the Body Ventura for one of the commentary teams. And the thing is, they're not completely out of place. For a lot of the audience, they would feel out of place, but Jim Ross had done play-by-play, -play, I believe, if memory serves me. I don't have my facts written down for that one, but he definitely called play-by-play -play for, I believe, college football, and I'm pretty sure the Atlanta Falcons at one point. I can, I can fact-check myself, and I'll put it here if I was wrong on that. But regardless, he had some football pedigree. Jim Ross is not completely foreign to this concept. So as a football commentator, you know, he's capable. And Jesse the Body Ventura, if memory serves me, also had some college football background. So the thing is, all these folks, while they were trying to cross over two genres, at least had some background in it. The problem was, it was too much WWF or WWE for a football audience, and then not enough wrestling for a wrestling audience. So unless you have had a wrestling fan who happened to be a football fan, which was a bit of a weird angle to take on it because a lot of... So imagine if you're a major football fan and you don't really care about wrestling that much. What are you going to watch on Monday night during the football season? Are you going to watch Monday Night Football or Monday Night Raw? Well, if the answer is you're going to watch Monday Night Football, well then automatically you've already discounted this league because number one, it wasn't going to be the same quality of football. Uh, that was a given. But then also they threw it together in a year. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this part of it, but the first key I think was the big one. You, you didn't really define your audience. You were trying to appeal to two things at the same time and kind of, it was a half measure that didn't really appeal to either. You got a lot of eyeballs in the first week because of curiosity, which I think in this ver iteration of the league, you'll probably get something similar. It might not be quite as enthusiastic, but we'll see what happens, but they definitely drew a good audience for the first week and then it quickly dropped off, dropped off, dropped off as it became clear that the football was borderline unwatchable, like it wasn't good. But that leads us to problem number two. Because you're trying to slap it together in a season, in a year basically, you had legitimate football people and one of the folks that was involved in one of the teams uh, was Bob Ackles, who was well known in Canadian football for being, uh, rising from being the water boy of the BC Lions to eventually becoming an executive. He was also an executive in the XFL with I believe the Las Vegas franchise. He's a guy who knows football. He had been in football for basically his entire life. And even in his biography, there was a mention of the XFL thing. And, if, and I remember reading it, and I believe the mention he gave it, he talked about different elements of it. But in his opinion, if they had been able to make it to a second season, he thought they would have done a lot better. Because by the second season, at least they had gotten through the first one, had the growing pains, made a bunch of mistakes. But then you would have had a full training camp. You would have been able to really scout the players better to get a better sense of what you were trying to do with it. A lot of the concepts were okay, but much to the same point as my first one, 
by slapping it together in a year, you weren't even able to fully hash out your own identity. And part of that also was reflected to me in the fact that you were changing rules, but getting rid of the coin toss, while it might seem like an interesting thing to do, um, the coin toss isn't really taking up that much of people's time. It's not throwing them off that much and creating basically a scramble where a player gets injured on the first try at this, at this new gimmick really wasn't a good way to sell your league right off the top. So little things like that would keep plaguing this league. And because the players weren't really up to speed, because these were, these were new rules to them, they were trying to throw this stuff together, they weren't very cohesive. So it created this very sloppy version of football, which really wasn't going to appeal to a football fan. And like I said, you don't have enough wrestling for the wrestling fans, so they're not going to stay tuned in either. They're going to tune in and start watching something else. Another element of it to that was I don't think they were able, able because the identity wasn't clear. They struggled to market it. They had a bunch of commercials. They had a lot of these things that they came up with to you know make it the XFL and do all that. But when you don't know what your identity is, you do things like calling the championship game the million dollar game. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. Okay, a million dollars is a lot of money. Even today, a million dollars is a lot of money. Do the fans really care if, if you give the winning team a million dollars for winning the championship? Literally just calling it the XFL championship, having a trophy that looks reasonable, that in and of itself would have done the job. But you had to make it into this whole thing, the million dollar. That, that tagline wouldn't have aged well. So you wouldn't have been able to keep it for very long. Eventually, you know, eventually what if a million dollars really doesn't feel like as much? For professional sports today, a million dollars top players, you know, even journeyman players in some of the major leagues make more than that. So it wouldn't have aged well. It's, it's one of those things where it's like it sounded, you know, maybe good inside of the boardroom when they're having a marketing session. But then when you're actually trying to sell it to an audience, not so much. So really it comes down to those elements. You couldn't define your audience. You couldn't really appeal to them because you didn't know who they really were or what you were trying to get out of it. You were trying to get so many disparate things that you ended up limiting yourself. And really, no one, no one stuck it out to the end. Um, and then by the time you might have had the chance, maybe in a second season, to fix some of those problems and really get to the bottom of it, uh, NBC was ready to pull the plug, basically. So when you really didn't have the support anymore going into the second season, you kind of would have had to go out on your own. In 2002, 2001, you weren't going to continue. That was going to be the end of it. So... With all that said, that's kind of what I see as being some of, you know, you can argue there are many more, but those were some of the big elements that I think hurt the league the first time. So that was the first question. Now that leads to the second question, which is, are these lessons going to be learned well enough in the new league? And what are the challenges that's going to face? So that's the next part of the video. Okay, so now we've talked about kind of what I think the biggest challenges were the first time around. So now let's talk about do I think it's going to work the second time around? So real quick, just to save everybody time, short answer, no, I don't think it's going to work. Um, and to be honest with you, just so we're clear, it's not that I don't want it to work. Having a viable alternative to the NFL would be fun. I enjoy watching the NFL. Uh, you know, I have my fair share of, you know, uh, swag for my team. I like to cheer on the Green Bay Packers. But the thing is, having another league wouldn't be an issue because for me, this league isn't really a competitor to the NFL. It's operating under a different niche. And I'll talk a little bit more about that with what I would do with the league if I was entrusted in trying to make it work. But I would love for this league to work. Now, the truth is, ha attaching it to this brand is a little bit tricky because it has a completely different connotation than what Vince was trying to portray in this version. He's using the same name, which is a bit of a tricky thing, because when I think of the XFL, I don't think of what he came up with. I think about this. And just so we're clear, I bought this, and what I'm gonna show you in a second, I bought this on eBay years after the fact, and I was able to get it pretty much, I think the two of them might have cost me $40 together. But I think of this when I think of the XFL. I bought this because quite frankly, I like this football. And I actually have it uh, hanging up in one of the shelves in my office. And I have fun looking at it from time to time. But this, this logo, this is the XFL to me. And if they had just brought back this thing with this logo, I still don't think it would work because of what I'm going to talk about in a second. But the truth is, at least I'd get a kick out of this. This would be what I would have wanted to see if you're going to bring back the XFL name. And if you're going to bring back the XFL name along the same lines, you got stuff like this. So it isn't he hate me, 
but you got a Las Vegas Outlaws. So, and I may have worn this unironically at a friend's Super Bowl party at one point because, quite frankly, it entertains me. But again, along the same lines, you can get this on eBay at discount if you can find one. Stuff like that. So I would love for this league to work because I think I'm probably one of the few people that would openly admit that I, I've watched basically all the, all the weeks of the original season. The only season, the one season, even including the championship game, uh, which was won by, I think it was the LA Extreme, and I think Tommy Maddox was the quarterback. Uh, so I kind of watched it. Uh, you had Rashawn Salam, you had He Hate Me, Rod Smart, uh, for Las Vegas. Um, I got a kick out of it. Uh, you know, it was silly. You know, New York Enforcers, like when you're talking about these, the Memphis Maniacs, that was that was the logo and uh, kind of a thing. And as I'm talking, I'll probably try to throw some pictures on here just to refresh your memory in case you remember from back then. Or maybe you've never heard, you never, you know of the league, but you didn't really catch on to it the first time around. Regardless, though, I would love for it to work. Just having an alternative to the NFL during the off season, I think, makes a good complementary product. And I'll talk about more about that with what I would do. But the reason why I don't think it's going to work is this. Vince McMahon is Vince McMahon. He said the right things in terms of he's going to wait two years instead of one. Give them a time to build the infrastructure. He does recognize that today's landscape, especially with the WB network and what some of the successes they've had with streaming, they understand that the landscape is different. Today you've got other options. And I'll talk a little more, more, more about that in a minute. But you can go online. You can go on TV. There's a lot of different ways of getting eyeballs onto your product that weren't available in 2001 or were just in their infancy. The problem is, at the end of the day, Vince's determination to make it work this time, taking uh, some of his WWE stock, selling it, creating his alpha entertainment. Now, it was a wise move of him to divorce it. He literally created a company that's specifically going to work on this. But I think this comes down, again, kind of delving into psychology. It, in addition to wanting to kind of write off this, uh, this failure for him from last time and wanting to take it fully into his hands, it really comes down to Vince has always kind of struggled outside of just the strictly wrestling world. You know, you can talk about Ico Pro. To be the World Wrestling Federation champion, you got to want it every day. It takes an integrated approach to training, and that is what Ico Pro is all about. You can talk about the World Bodybuilding Federation, the XFL the first time around. You know, this did not turn out well. WBF did not turn out well. And Ico Pro did not turn out necessarily very well. And even things like WWE Pictures, you know, WWE, their movie studio. Um, other than churning out, you know, marine sequels, I don't see exactly what it is they're doing. So he really hasn't had much success outside of WWE. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but the point is it's, it's not a great track record to go from. So anybody who cites his successes in WWE is like, that's great. But in that genre, he's had successes. That doesn't mean he's been perfect, but he's definitely had success there and built a major brand. Trying to build a football brand, though, trying to do it in 2018, 2019, 2020, is going to need more than that. You're going to actually need to listen to some of these football people you say you're going to talk to. And he said many things that, you know, sound good, but then make bring other questions. He said you're going to talk to the best doctors and everything. Well, football players are going to get concussions. That's a very serious problem. You're not going to pay the players as much. So then that leads to other questions. And I've got some suggestions about that that I'll speak to at the very end. But where are you going to market it? Where are you going to have these teams? Where are you going to have the actual venues? Um, I have my thoughts on what I would do for that. But at the same time, lots of unanswered questions. And that's okay because at the moment he hasn't committed to anything. And it's better not to commit to anything while you're working out all those details and logistics. But the truth is... I don't know if push comes to shove, if things don't work well right out of the block, if after building that infrastructure, taking almost two years of his life by then, and 2020 rolls around, they start it off, they figure out some kind of broadcasting arrangement, whatever they end up doing, if it's not working out of the block, how long before he starts interfering in it? How, how long before he starts stepping in, and even though he says he's not going to be directly involved, other than to kind of be the owner and oversee, how long before he resists the urge to start meddling and tampering? If he is, in fact, stepping away back from the WWE where he's had pretty much unquestioned control, how long before he wants to take control of this one? 
Those things make me think the answer is no on this league. Plus, to be perfectly honest, while I have kind of some nostalgic feelings about the XFL, I think of it kind of in an amusing, nostalgic tone. It wasn't really that good a product the first time. So you're really, you can redo the logo, but you're still going to be associated to this. When people tune in, they're going to think, the ones who remember it, are going to think this the first time around, at least for a while while you're doing it. You're really going to have to sell them on a very different product than what you had the first time. And it's going to have to be a better product. So with that, my prediction, like I said, is going to be no. I don't think it's going to work. If it lasts beyond the first season, I will be very impressed. I'm hopeful that they do. But now, let me talk about what I would do, taking the lessons from the first section. What would I do to try to make it different? What would I do to try to change that fate if I genuinely think it's not going to work? So that's what I'm going to talk about right now. All right, last part. And if you've gotten, by the way, to this part of the video, you're awesome. So congratulations to you and thank you for sticking around. So here's what, I'm, here's what I would do if it was up to me. I get the call and, it, and I have to try to make this league work. Knowing what we know about the past, knowing what we know about the potential pitfalls here and some of the things that could get in your way, what do you do? So I have kind of a multi-pronged strategy for me. What it comes down to is, number one, on top of everything else, before you even worry about where you're going to have the games, how you're going to house them, how you're going to market this league, you need to make sure that the football people you put in place focus with their number one priority on the play quality. No matter what, you know if you're not going to get the best players in the world, you know this, because you're not going to be able to pay what the NFL is paying. You're starting the league with $100 million. Most of these, te Most of the teams, to be perfectly honest, and I, I can double check that, but I don't think any of the teams even have a payroll under $100 million. Well, when you're starting off with that, you're not going to compete with the NFL's money. They've got multi-billion dollar television deals, distribution all over the place, merchandise. It's a juggernaut. You're not competing with the NFL. And I feel like that should be in bold letters somewhere. You're not competing with the NFL. In fact, you should probably try to be friends with the NFL in the sense of you're a complimentary product. Vince went out of his way to say they're not a developmental league. That's fine. In practice, you're a developmental league. doesn't matter. As long as you're not paying as much as the NFL is and you're not a direct route. If you're not the AFL in the 1960s, you're a developmental league for the NFL. If they see talent that they think is worthwhile, they will offer them 10 times what you're offering them. So with that understood, though, that doesn't mean you can't have a good quality product. Focusing on the quality product standpoint, my target, if it was me, would be to target trying to get it basically to the level of college football, and then maybe a half step higher. So you're not trying to bridge the gap all the way to the NFL level, but you're trying to be a step above college football, meaning you want the product to be, you want the games to be entertaining. You want them to be fun to watch. He made an emphasis that he's going to try to make the games more streamlined. That's fine. That might work actually to a certain degree for a group of the audience. It wouldn't be my main focus, but it's not a bad idea. It's just, you got to be careful how you're going to do it. And depending on how your distribution is going to be, if you're not going to be a network television, you can probably cut out some of those TV timeouts, and that's probably going to help you with that. You could do the running clock. That'd be a little tricky, but you could do it. There's different things you could do. That'd be, that'd be something you'd have to figure out as you go along. But the number one focus would be play quality. I would target that college football level, and then maybe a little bit higher. That leads me to the second part. How are you going to get the players? Well, there are going to be some players for sure that are going to be interested. Now, he's already kind of made emphasis that he would exempt, he basically he doesn't want any players with criminal records or even DUIs or everything. That's fine. Uh, you are limiting yourself a little bit in terms of your player pool, which is already going to be a little bit limited because if they're good enough for the NFL, they're probably already in the NFL. But you've still got a potential pool of really good players that could fit this mold. For me, my targets would be the best players available that still fit your criteria, but really I would focus on recruiting college players that are four-year starters at different colleges, especially players who know that they're good enough to play football, but probably aren't going to be drafted by the NFL and have already kind of worked uh, their college careers as such where they're focused, they're doing the education piece. They're actually doing it because their expectation is not that they're going to play at the NFL level, but they still want to play football. The XFL here can provide a venue for these players who might still want to play football and might actually want to be able to play it at a professional level that isn't the NFL level. And then you're offering them the opportunity. And you can sell this to them with the model where Vince made reference to having them as 12-month employees instead of just paying them for the season. 
If you're going to do that, you could target these players by saying, this is a salary for 12 months. That's where you can stick in your clauses. This is what we expect of you, how you represent the league, how you represent yourself, blah, blah, blah. Put the clauses in there. Make sure everybody knows what they are. But if you go that route, one of the things that I would do, and this would be a helpful selling point for some of these players, you include health coverage. Now, this isn't something you go out of your way to advertise, but it's what I would do to help pitch the players and try to get players who might otherwise be on the fence. If I'm going to go and I can work regular work for X amount, but I really have my heart set on playing football still, following college, this could be something that would give me a little extra incentive because you're probably not going to be able to offer a salary that may entice me beyond you know, a certain point. But having that health coverage is huge. Now, one argument I saw, uh, Stevie Richards on YouTube was talking about this exact topic, the XFL. And he pointed out that for WWE, they don't really have that. And the only counter I would make to that is that a lot of the WWE superstars that operate in Vince's company, there, there would be a little bit of a contradiction, but not necessarily. The only reason I say so is because even though the WWE folks are treated as independent contractors, which is the point he made, in this league, if you do treat them like employees, you can justify it in the sense that they're probably going to be paid a lot less. If they're making forty-five or 50000 as opposed to a WWE superstar whose ceiling, assuming depending on how much they're earning for WWE, could be potentially higher, there is merchandise, there is all that. If you're not going to give the players merchandise because they're not necessarily going to be marketed as individuals, they're players as part of a team, and they're going to be effectively employees, giving them that health coverage actually makes a lot of sense because you're not paying them enough where they can just cover it themselves and you're not really making them independent contractors because I'll be honest with you, as an independent contractor, if I have to work 12 months for you for 50 grand or whatever, that's not really a great deal. If there's no other deal in place or anything else I can do, there's a lot of jobs though where you can probably make that. And if you're a full four-year college player or whatever, you probably have a degree in something because you weren't planning on the NFL being your backup plan or your primary plan. So that's just the angle I would take on that. So focusing on those kind of players, trying to entice them by bringing in things like health coverage, that would be certain angles that I would take with it. Following with that, so I'm going to talk about distribution in a second. But the next thing that I would do is, kind of following the theme of embracing the colleges, would be, you need venues for this, for this league. With $100 million in starting capital, you're not going to build any stadiums. You're probably not going to retrofit a lot of stadiums. I would probably try and see if I could strike deals with U.S. colleges who already have football stadiums in place. Some of those football stadiums are already vastly superior to any retrofit that you would try to do on non-NFL fields. So you've already got these stadiums in place all around the country. So that opens up a couple of things for you. You've already got these stadiums built in different parts of the country, depending on where you want to go that already have these communities that are already used to, and at least are, are, have a little bit of a tradition in flocking to these stadiums. I wouldn't necessarily target the big ones, maybe not the big house in Michigan and things like that, but you could go to Michigan State, you could go to, you could go to a couple different places that might be good. That opens up a lot of possibilities for you to try to market to non-traditional markets, which might be a good way of building yourself your own little niche, starting at the base level. And if you come up with a good deal where you kind of do a little bit of sharing with the school, maybe say, you know what, we'll split the revenues on concessions and things like that. If you can strike a deal with them to use the venue during time they're not going to use it anyway, it can be a win for you and a win for the school. And there's some great PR for you. So, you know, you're helping out education, you're helping out the kids and you, the people you're hiring are your four-year college players. Of course, you're going to get players from different places that, have, that would still like to play professional football. But I'm just saying from a marketing standpoint, that's kind of a win-win. You're giving yourself different options and you're making it, you're differentiating yourself from the NFL as more of a people's league because these aren't really going to be larger than life players. They're still going to be good players. And if you make the quality of football watchable and solid, you're going to do well, but you're still distinguishing yourself. So stuff like that would be the angle that I would take and really try to build like a college atmosphere around these teams to really differentiate yourself from the NFL game day experience because you're going to have to be different. If you try to be exactly the same, you're just going to be an inferior version of the NFL, and that's not going to work. Okay, so next is distribution. So how do you get it out there to eyeballs? So this is where you could really get creative. 
The upside of being in the year 2020 or 2019, 2020, is that you have a lot of options available to you that you did not have in 2001. One of them, what you're looking at, what you're watching me on right now, the internet. You have streaming video options all over the landscape, different things that are looking for content. You have the Netflix of the world, the Amazon Primes of the world, even YouTube. You have these companies that are trying to get constantly original content. Well, sports is the best original content there is. Some would argue that maybe you start up your own XFL streaming thing. I wouldn't, not out of the blocks, not at the very beginning, because you simply don't have the brand equity. You've got too much negative baggage associated to the brand to begin with. Well, out of the block, guess what? If you try to do it as a package, you're telling me that I have to pay to see an unproven league that I haven't seen a game for. Even if you offer a free month or two, you're not gonna get anywhere with that. And you're gonna have to pay all the costs to build the infrastructure and get everything set up. No, don't bother with any of that. My approach would be to go to the Amazons, say, you know what, let's do a deal. We'll provide this original content to you. We already have the expertise because we can use leverage some of the expertise we have with WWE where they know about production value. They know how to record live events. They know how to distribute them. You use your expertise, what you know, what you're good at. You use that and you say, let's do a deal. We'd love to offer you some content and let's figure something out. So you could play this out a lot of different ways because there's a lot of different options. You could say, let's get this out on Amazon Prime because this might be a good way of encouraging some more people of buying the Amazon Prime to get the video. So if you can see every live game here, here's just another selling point. It's a value add. You're not buying Amazon Prime because you want to see the XFL. You're buying Amazon Prime because maybe you want faster shipping on Amazon, different offers that you get throughout the year. Oh, by the way, you can also see the XFL, plus you've got movies and TV shows, and they have their own original content that they've already paid for. It's just a value add. So by doing that, you're partnering up with someone who already has a video platform. You can do the similar thing with Netflix, again, along the same lines. YouTube itself also offers a po some possibilities with YouTube Red, but it isn't available in every country. You'd want to have a way of monetizing it where you're kind of contributing to their bottom line so that you're offering a cut. This is where it gets a little bit interesting. If it was me and I could just do whatever I wanted to do, and again, you still have to work out these deals. You got to negotiate, you got to talk it through. You've got to make it worth their while because guess what? You're not coming from a position of power. The truth is, no matter what Vince McMahon wants to tell anybody, nobody is clamoring for the XFL. There are some fans who might be nostalgic for it, but these providers are not necessarily looking for your product. You need to make it so that it's attractive to them. You need to figure out a way to make a deal where it's like, let's grow, let's build this up, and then it will become more valuable asset as we go along. Well, part of that is I would, I would approach the Amazon or the Netflix and say, you're going to be the primary provider, you're going to be our number one. But can we work something into the deal where maybe we get one game a week into a platform like a YouTube? The reason being is then you're also cultivating a second relationship at the same time and you're working with the Amazon or Netflix and you're saying, let's do this. They're the paid platform. But then what you do with the YouTube is you do a game of the week for free, especially for the first season. You do at least one game a week where it's totally available to anyone who can access the platform on the internet. Why would you give away a game that way? Because you want exposure. You're starting with nothing. You've been, all you've got is the equity from this. And the thing is, you're not even selling this logo. So you're selling your own kind of modification of this. So if you are not going to sell the same product as that, and you're not, you're saying the football is gonna be different, you're saying you're gonna get rid of the gimmicks, you're saying you're gonna, I don't think you're even gonna have cheerleaders, I think was part of it, fine. If you're gonna divorce yourself completely from it, then you need to get it in front of as many eyeballs as possible, as easily as possible. Having a game of the week gives you an option where you know what, somebody might not be willing to take a flyer on you, Maybe they were borderline with Amazon Prime, but your, your offering isn't enough to get them over the line. If you focus on that quality of play and you start actually having good games on and you have a game of the week that's consistently on a certain night of the week, you figure it out. You make it a Saturday night, Sunday night, whatever you have to do. If it's consistent and the games are decent, they're watchable, they're fun to watch, and the production values are good, you can actually build an audience that starts maybe following a local team that they want to see that they can't see on the game of the week every week. You rotate it around the league and all of a sudden you have an inducement saying you can run ads all through the broadcast saying if you want to watch the rest of the games for this week, 
They're available on Amazon Prime or they're available on Netflix. You know, go to your local country's website here to access it, you know, enjoy their free month of service, try it out, see if you want to, you know, stay with it and you're gonna have movies and all these other things. You're promoting them and at the same time, that gives them motivation to promote you. At the same time, you're making a good relationship with YouTube, they're getting some live content as well. It's kind of a win across the board. The point is, at this stage, you want to make as many friends with content platforms as possible. Not necessarily to compete them against each other, but rather to have different ways of people accessing you in different parts of the world, depending on what they can see. So that's my main distribution thought. That's how I would approach the distribution piece. And if, after actually building that momentum, you reach a stage where you can actually reach out to some broadcast partners in TV that wanna have your product, then you make a deal with whoever you have, your Amazon or your Netflix or whatever, you work something out where they remain the streaming source, but then maybe you work out a deal where there's a game of the week on live television or you go to the, you come up with some arrangement where maybe they do the playoffs and the championship game. So to get as many eyeballs potentially as possible, you need to make it into an event. You need to build momentum throughout that first season. The playoffs and the championship game is your last opportunity to really put a stamp on it and build momentum that you can carry to season two. Season one is basically gonna be an experiment from front to back. Whatever you do, merchandise wise, locations wise, everything is up for grabs as far as ideas. But you have to make sure that cohesively throughout it, you have some kind of a steady improvement in the quality of play. It's got to be good because if it's not fun to watch, no one's going to watch. They're going to tune out. And that's the end of that. So those are my main thoughts on it. The only other point I'll touch on is not a distribution piece. It's just the branding piece. It's going to be really interesting to me to see what happens. While the logo that they showed off in the, in the press conference is kind of a red, white, and blue thing, I understand Vince's uh, proclivities to, towards you know, super patriotism, but the truth is if it was me, you know, keep the logo, fine, you wanna, you wanna change the brand up slightly and differentiate it slightly from the original XFL, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into the patriotism super. Because while there will be some people who will be interested in that, the truth is this, even the people that care about patriotism, it's only useful to you if it actually means they're gonna be monetized. If, you can, if this patriotism means, okay, I'm watching you over the NFL and I'm gonna buy tickets to the games, I'm gonna buy merchandise, I'm gonna do all that, well then fine, go for it. Have a bald eagle you know, fly out you know, as your flyover for every game. Do whatever you wanna do. Have somebody dress up as Uncle Sam run down the field. But the truth is, I don't think that many people are going to actually be motivated by that to spend money. And if they're not motivated by that to spend money, then who cares? It's, and to anybody international, outside of the United States, that's not a selling point. Now you can make the argument, and I'd hear you, that the main market that you're targeting here is the US, absolutely. But don't forget, even the NFL with all its power is still doing games in London, England, is still having traveling road shows into Canada, around here. Why? Because they still wanna expand the brand. In the Toronto area here, the Buffalo Bills are the closest team to us. They've been terrible for 20 years. They still have thousands of season ticket holders from Canada who want to be able to watch the NFL games live and enjoy camping down and going to the games. You need as many potential eyeballs on this as possible from any part of the world that they'll watch. Expatriates who want to watch an American game, anything you can get, you have to be including as many people as possible and not driving them away. And that's my last thought on this. So bottom line, I don't think they're going to pull it off. There are a bunch of things that I would do if it was me, and I wish them the best of luck. I'll be watching in 2020. If anything interesting comes up, I may talk about it in a video, but other than that, that's my thoughts on the return of the XFL in the year 2020. Let me know if you have any thoughts or comments. We pre I appreciate anything, any feedback you might have. I'm not gonna make videos like this all the time, but I th this is something that I, I, would, I got enough of a kick out of that I really wanted to talk about. If you made it to the end of this really long video, thank you so much. Um, like, subscribe, and comment, and uh, I'll talk to you next time. Thanks.